Welcome back to the Lightning Podcast. Men have flocked to David's side. God is beginning to build his loyal followers little by little. Now at chapter 23 of 1 Samuel, the cat and mouse game between Saul and David begins in earnest. This is a fairly long season in David's life and will consume the rest of the book. Saul intensifies his attempts to kill David as David gains more followers and support. Now David will be put to the test with greater challenges and greater burdens than he's experienced so far. Despite it all, David refuses to rise up against Saul, and instead he focuses on avoiding him and helping the people of Israel. So how does he survive such a perilous time in his life? By constantly leaning on the Lord for direction. 1 Samuel chapter 23, verse 1 and 2 are, Then they told David, saying, Behold, the Philistines are fighting against Calah and are plundering the threshing floors. So David inquired of the Lord and said, Shall I go and attack these Philistines? And the Lord said to David, Go and attack the Philistines and deliver Calah. Even though David is on the run from Saul, he's not just concerned only for himself. Now, we talked about this before. He had good reason to refuse to help other people and just kind of, you know, worry about himself. But instead, because he's this tireless servant leader, David is looking out for the welfare of his people Israel, which, of course, is one of the most important characteristics of, as you would imagine, a good king. Kela was a city about 10 miles west from where David and his men are currently staying, the forests of Hareth. And the Philistine territories were east of Kela, not that far away. So you could imagine how easy it was for the enemy to swoop in and attack this city. The text later on says that it's a fortified city with secure gates and bars, so it wouldn't have been easy to take, but it would have been valuable to the Philistines because it would have gotten them closer to Israel. And if they were to capture it, it would have been a great fort and a staging ground for other attacks inside the nation of Israel. So how does the Philistines attack a city if it's so hard? You know, it's attacking a fortified city. As you can imagine, it was extremely difficult. So they're being very strategic. Instead of attacking the city head on, they're trying to deprive the city and the the citizens of their food. It says they were attacking or plundering the threshing floors. Now, that was the place outside the city where near the farming, near the fields, where they were literally uh, collecting the grain. They would separate the good grain from the chaff and would gather that up and bundle it up and use that for the food of the people. So that was a perfect spot. That's like the end, so, so to speak, of the assembly line, right when the product comes out and the Philistines are showing up and taking it. So that was their strategy. They were, instead of attacking the city directly, which they would have eventually have done, they're first depriving the people of their food, taking it for themselves to starve them out. Believe it or not, this is a very common tactic when you're sieging cities all the way up into the Middle Ages. It was really hard just to storm a city with thick walls. They had a very uh, strategic standpoint. They could easily shoot at you and they were relatively safe. So the best thing you did was surround the city, cut it off from its supply, and that people would be forced to surrender or, or starve. It was awful, but it worked. So, of course, David hears about this, and being the strategist that he was, he knows what the Philistines are trying to do, and he immediately wants to help his people. But notice he doesn't just rush in to defend the city with such a small group of men that he has. By this time, we learn later on that he has about 600 men. It's not a lot against the Philistines, who may have had thousands of soldiers. So, he first asks the Lord for guidance. Now, the text doesn't say specifically how he did this or how God answered him. It's possible that the priest who was with him now, Abiathar, was the one who gave the response or prayed on David's behalf. It's possible that the prophet Gad, who was there previously, is still there with David and he had a word from the Lord. Or maybe God spoke to him directly in some way. But in any case, David's not going to do anything until God gives him clear direction. Now, before chapter 22, it, you may have noticed it doesn't specifically say David did this every time he made a decision. 
but there are a few things we should keep in mind. With very few exceptions, David's not doing anything without guidance from the Lord. The moment he fled for his life, he's been acting on God-given wisdom. At Nob, we find out that he did seek direction from the Lord, from the high priest. When he was at Mitzpah, the prophet showed up, told him to leave Moab and go back to Judah. This is a critical time in David's life, even more critical than before when he was just one man on the run. His life and the lives of all the people with him are at stake. One false move, and he and many other people could die. So it's imperative that David relies on God's help, especially when making decisions like where to go, where to live, and if he should go into a battle. Now, you might be asking yourself right now, well, that's great for David. That's pretty nice he got these directions from God. I wish God gave me direction like that. Well, my friend, have you bothered to ask? I find that most Christians are content with just living their lives as they see fit. When they need it, the Bible's there. To sprinkle on a little bit of, of wisdom when, when they have a problem. Or just to make their life a little bit better. But they don't bother to seek God for direction until they're in some kind of jam. Usually a problem of their own making. Then they panic, scrambling to get some kind of help from God. Then out of impatience, they get upset because they don't think God is immediately giving them an answer or speaking to them. The reality is, we need to cultivate a lifestyle of dependence on the Lord. He is the vine, and we are the branches. That means our life depends on Him. It comes from Him. That includes direction for our lives. If you are daily seeking to learn from God, you will find Him speaking to you constantly. So how do you learn from God daily? How do you hear him daily? By studying his word and through prayer. When a person is saturated with God's word, they are more in tune with what his spirit is saying. A person regularly fellowshipping with God through his word and prayer isn't at a loss for what God is speaking to them. That doesn't mean you're going to hear an audible answer from God all the time like David did. I don't know anyone who's experienced that. But God will daily speak to you. He'll direct your thoughts, minister wisdom and grace to your heart. And long before the trial comes, you will know what God is saying. Now, that doesn't mean you'll know everything or you'll never have any questions. But it does mean you will learn how to hear God's voice. And you will, when trying to make decisions, be able to figure out what he's directing you to do. In some cases, he'll give you a direct uh guidance, kind of like David, maybe that direct. You'll just know this is what I need to do. Maybe you'll have several different options, and with the wisdom and discernment God gives you, you recognize what's the right decision, what's the wrong decision. No matter how it works out, you will have God directing you, but you need to cultivate that on a daily basis as a part of your lifestyle of faith. If we're like David and seek God's will in everything, we will begin to see him work in our lives on a very consistent basis. But most Christians don't know God's voice because they are spiritually lazy, content on their pastor or elders or teachers or so-and-so doing the listening for them. Don't be like that. As we see, David is ready to go up and defend Kayla from the Philistines, but he encounters a problem. In verse 3, it says, But David's men said to him, Behold, we are afraid here in Judah. How much more than if we go to Kela against the ranks of the Philistines? So it shouldn't come as a surprise that David's men are afraid. They explained to him that they are afraid even in the land of Judah, where there is some measure of security from Saul. We could assume Saul is less likely to invade to get to David in Judah, since David is from the tribe of Judah. And the people will consider him one of their own, and they wouldn't cooperate with Saul to betray David. They might actually fight to defend David. So there's this kind of idea that they're a little bit safe. On top of that, David and his men are deeper in the territory of Israel and a little more secure from sudden Philistine attacks. So in the natural, it looks like they're all safe. But despite this, they're still afraid. 
So what does this teach us? Putting our trust in earthly circumstances or earthly things does not eliminate our fear. This is something so critical we need to learn because the world is constantly telling us that the solution to our fears, our worries, our needs is more money, more earthly things. Go to college, get a good job, build your wealth. The more you have, the better off you will be. But that is a lie. You could have millions of dollars in the bank and still be living in fear. You could do everything the world says you're supposed to do to be secure. Get the right education, get a job in an industry that will provide stable employment. But guess what? Separated by just a few days, the two largest social media companies in the world just recently laid off thousands of employees. Social media, like all careers in computer science and technology, has long been considered a safe and stable career path. It's booming. Everyone uses social media. So if you get a job there and you can code, you're, you're good to go. But when Elon Musk bought Twitter, he fired over half the company, over 3,000 employees, in just a few days. And a week didn't pass before Mark Zuckerberg, the owner of Meta and Facebook, fired over 11,000 employees. Tens of thousands of people who thought they were safe because they picked the right career path and the right job are now out of work. And they're now having to scramble to find new employment somewhere else. And this tells us that even if you do all the right things the way the world tells you, you don't have security. Because you cannot find that security, that freedom from fear in earthly things. You see, David's men are afraid despite being in a rel relatively safe situation. Remember, these men fled to David hoping he'd help them. Most of them were disenfranchised and poor. They came to David hoping he could fix the problems in their lives or put them on the right path. And despite having a great man like David leading them, they were still terrified. That's because the only true solution to paralyzing fear is the love of God. 1 John 4.18 says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves punishment. And the one who fears is not perfected in love. So we don't have to fear if we focus on the love of God, his great love for us. Now why is that? How are those two even connected in this way? Because if we truly understood how much God loves us, what is there to fear? We would understand that the greatest being in all the universe, the creator in heaven and earth, is taking care of us. Nothing in this life would scare us because God is so much greater. And he has vowed in his word never to leave us nor forsake us. So nothing in this life, sickness, lack, losing a job, losing this and that, none of that would really hurt us because God is going to provide for us. And even if the worst thing were to happen that we would lose our lives, we have hope. Because God promised all those who believe in Jesus Christ would be carried by him safely into his heavenly kingdom. So not even death should be a cause for fear, because God is on our side. And why is he on our side? Because of his great love for us. So David's men didn't understand their need to trust in the God of Israel who loved them. So it was up to David to teach them. Now let's ask for a minute, what would Saul have done in this situation? If his men refused to fight because they were afraid. Well, we could probably assume young Saul, who constantly feared what men thought of him, would have cowered and let his men control him and not fight when he should have fought. But the older Saul, whose fear of men grew and bloomed into this ugly obsession for power and pride, would have demanded they fight for him or he would have punished them. Instead, David being so different, once again does the right thing. Verses 4 and 5 say, Then David inquired of the Lord once more. And the Lord answered him and said, Arise, go down to Calah, for I will give the Philistines into your hand. So David and his men went to Calah and fought with the Philistines, and he led away their livestock and struck them with a great slaughter. Thus David delivered the inhabitants of Calah. Look at that! They're successful. Only 600 men, and they were able to drive off a what would have been a much larger fighting force from Philistines. But David, look, he didn't dismiss his men's concerns. He didn't scold them. He didn't cave in. He didn't demand they follow him and prove their loyalty. 
Instead, he taught them what the right thing to do was by modeling it before them. He once again asked the Lord for guidance and would have brought that message to the men, or he would have done it with them in their presence. Let's pray. Let's seek God. And God's answer was much the same as it was before. That's not a bad thing. That's confirmation. God's not scolding David for praying a second time. We know the Bible teaches us to often seek God in prayer, to continually ask him for his help. And this response is confirmation that David and his men would succeed. Now, the only time God would have been upset with David for asking a second time was if David was being reluctant and disbelieving. We see that sometimes in the Bible where someone, God tells someone to do something and they're like, oh, are you sure? And God has to get a little bit uh, disciplinary with them because they're out of fa- disbelief and fear. They're not really believing God. That was the case of Zacharias, the father of John the Baptist, who was, who was like an angel appears before him and he's like, well, I'm not really sure. And so the angel has to get a little stern and strike him um, with muteness until the, the John is born. But this is not the case. David's doing this for the benefit of his men. He was already set on going and fighting to save the city, but he prays again so the men can see that God was going to deliver the enemies into their hand. You notice in this second time, uh, God says, he adds, I am going to deliver them into your hands. That was unique. God was being gracious to David's men, teaching them that they were going to succeed, not because of their might, And not even because they had David with him, but because God was going to give them the victory. This little moment of fear was actually an opportunity for these men to grow in their faith in God. And to learn not to trust in their earthly circumstances anymore for security. God's response directly addresses the problem. When he says, I am going to deliver them into your hand, he's assuring these soldiers that they were going to win the battle. Not because of their might, not because of how good warriors they were, not because of David, but because the Lord was with them. That's an important thing to remember as we journey through this book. There are some very um, impressive men of God in 1 Samuel and impressive women of God. We have Hannah, we have Samuel, we have David. And it's real easy to become enamored with these people. And it's easy in our own life to become enamored with the people around us. We may have really impressive friends or elders or leaders, or there might be church leaders, um, preachers that you know of, and you read their books, and you're so impressed with them, and, and your confidence is in them and their ability to lead and to teach and to inspire you. And that's wonderful that there's, there are great people of faith who can inspire us. But we need to remember our success, our progress in faith, our sanctification, our maturity in the Lord has nothing to do with people. Our trust cannot even be in people as great as David. God said, I am going to deliver the enemy into your hand. It wasn't because they had David with them. It's because the Lord was on their side. And God, in his grace, is teaching them that. That's how God's word works. He addresses our problems head on and provides the solution. God is amazingly deft at getting to the heart of our problem. Even if we're reading a passage of the Bible and we don't think it directly addresses a specific issue we're going through, quite often we realize this is talking about what I'm going through or it is uh, applicable in some way because the Holy Spirit can illuminate truth that we need the moment we need it. That's why if you're going through a problem and you're like, I am I need God's direction, I need his help, I don't know what to do, start reading through scripture. You don't know where to start? Just pick a book that you want to read. Pick a passage you want to read, and believe it or not, the Holy Spirit will even use that passage to minister to you what you need to hear. And then you can keep reading, keep praying, and learn more from the Lord. Because that's what's so amazing about His Word. That's so amazing about the Holy Spirit who's promised to lead us into truth. The issue facing David's men was fear of death. They were afraid even when they looked to their environment for safety. But God taught them they had no need to fear as long as he was guiding them. Their hope and security were in the Lord, not in anything else. And we see there was no more protests after this response. They gladly went with David into battle, and they defeated the Philistines, and the Bible says, with a great slaughter. They wiped those suckers out. And they even took the Philistines' plunder, their livestock. 
And that's after we saw the Philistines were robbing Kayla of their grain. So the city's fortunes were totally reversed thanks to David and his men. Before, the enemy was taking their food, trying to starve them to death. But now, not only are the Philistines defeated, but Kayla receives their livestock as kind of like a repayment for what they took from them. In just a few verses, we learn so much. Again, God is teaching us to trust in Him above our circumstances. And He's promising us that He will speak to us and guide us as long as we, like David, cultivate a lifestyle of listening to His voice. But we're soon going to find out that Kayla repays David's bravery and kindness with betrayal. And things shift very quickly in this story. We're going to find out next time. Thank you for listening to Lightning Podcast. Check us out at lightningpodcast.org.